What's up dudes, it's Matt Winning at winningstrength.com. We're here again today and we're going to talk about the evolution of American strength training. So we've been doing some history points, but I thought this was pretty interesting. I've kind of studied this quite a bit and I'd like to share with you what I know and maybe it'll give you some inclination on where we're at now in strength training and how we got there. So let's get to it. In America, strength training really began, in my personal opinion, in the 1950s. There was a lifter named Paul Anderson. Paul Anderson was from Georgia. He was super strong. He was like 5'6", 330-something pounds. Um, he was the first and the last American to win a gold medal in Olympic weightlifting. Now, with that being said, when he went to the Olympics, the Soviets saw him and they went in search of people like him in order for them to get the records back. And when they found Vasily Alexiev, that started the whole conjugate system. But in the 50s, there was a man named Paul Anderson, and Paul Anderson was heavily known for training very, very oddly. He would squat out of pits with big 60-gallon drums filled full of concrete, and he would do it at different heights. So he would squat 1,000 to 1,200 pounds at quarter squats, half squats, um, all kinds of shit. But at the end of the day, he was kind of the first guy that really pushed lifting to the next level. You have to remember at this time, there was no powerlifting. There was really not even really any many gyms as far as strength training is concerned. Um, so things of that nature, gyms were just kind of not really existent. Fast forward about another 10 years, you run into a lifter named Pat Cassie. Pat Cassie was the first man to bench 500 and 600 pounds of I know 600 for sure, but he, I think he was also the guy, the first guy to bench press 500. When Pat Cassie came along, he was kind of a monster among mortals. He had humongous lifts. He was a monstrous man, six foot-ish, somewhere around 300 pounds, pretty damn jacked, and kind of started the ball rolling into maximal strength in the Americans. A lot of that had to do with magazines. That's when um, a lot of the older magazines started coming out. Pat Cassie started writing some articles. And there was just this aura of, I want to be big and strong, I want to be masculine. Pat Cassie kind of embraced that in the 60s. Now, pushing into the 60s and 70s, obviously we had Arnold Schwarzenegger and all those other guys in bodybuilding. We're going to stick more into the performance side and maybe say some names that you may not know of or you should know of if you're in strength training or plan on going into strength conditioning or personal training. I would say the man that made the most difference in the 70s, this is a very, very open statement and everybody can have their own different thought process, but in the science of sports training, and really in my opinion, Boyd Epley has to be given credit for being the man of the 70s. And the reason for that is, is Boyd Epley was studying a lot of jumping and strength training by the Eastern Germans and, and Soviet bloc countries and noticing that their athletes were very powerful and very strong. And when he did that, he came back as a graduate assistant to the University of Nebraska, which we all know was a massive powerhouse in football in the 70s, and said, I think that if we change how we condition and how we strength train, which you gotta remember in the 70s, nobody was lifting weights to play football. If we make a structured weight training program and we do things a little bit differently like the Eastern Bloc countries are doing, we should be able to create a juggernaut and make our guys much stronger than the guys they compete with in football. Well. Fast forward a couple of years later, Nebraska becomes the dominant force in football and is the revered program of the 70s. Why? They were just better conditioned and stronger than the rest of the players that they played. And the reason was because Boyd Epley was willing to try to promote this at University of Nebraska. And don't get me wrong, he had a lot of friction to do that. The head coach sat down and listened to what he had to say, agreed with it, told him that we're gonna try it, but if it doesn't work, we're gonna fire you. So Boyd Epley may have never been what he was if in fact the players didn't get better and they didn't start to become so dominant. That started to lead almost everyone in the 80s to adopt strength training in almost every sport. You have to understand that really strength training for even football didn't become widespread national until almost 1990. Uh, the strength training program at Ball State University, where I went to school, which was one of the founding schools of the NSCA, um, didn't have a strength training program until 1983-84. So think about that. A Division I football team 
didn't have a strength training program until 84. All the other schools didn't catch up until around 90. So the point is, is that strength training in America is still fairly young for sports and is the reason that we have so much conflicting ideas and abilities. And the reason is because it's so new. If you think about it, so this hasn't been invented since 1990 on a mass scale. So you got 10 years till 2000, 10 years till 2010. It's only been around 30 years and everybody fights over which way's better and which way's this and which way's that. And the answer is we're never really gonna know because one, we don't stay in our prime long enough. Two, studies aren't done with high enough level athletes. And three, they're not done long enough. I.e., if you really want a great strength program, you're talking a minimum of two to four years in order for you to do it correctly. Well, that's the entire college strength training session or program, right? Freshman to senior. So I think that we're still going to be finding that a lot of new stuff's going to come out, a lot of stuff's going to come and go, and we're still trying to figure out how to do that. But in the 80s, everything got adapted to the mass scale. So there was a lot of things that got mixed up. You had bodybuilders coming in and promoting hit style training, which is one set till failure like Mike Mincer stuff. You had the NSCA pushing Olympic lifting as the predominant force, power clean snatches. Not that they're all wrong, but there's a certain build you need to have for Olympic weightlifting. And is it transfer to football and track? And maybe, maybe not. You have bodybuilding, you have powerlifting, you have all these different scenarios that are creating uh, strength training, a, a huge complex of different methods and ideas in order to understand. But now, from the 80s, at least they're there. Now, in the 90s, more and better research starts to evolve. So Ball State had its, you know, from Dr. Costell had its strength and research program. We had uh, hyperbaric chambers that were the size of whole rooms to work out in. We had jump force plates. We had all kinds of stuff, but we were really starting to study how strength really works and why. But the real limiting factor to all of these particular studies and still today is we're just not utilizing guys that are at an elite level. One, there's not that many of them, and two, they're hard to study. So what do we utilize? We utilize recreationally trained athletes or even Division I college athletes that may or may not be very skilled in weightlifting. They do a, say, a five or six or 10 week study, and then we start to base all of our training off that. Is that correct? The answer is probably not. But it's also the reason why we fight over stuff and why, if you read research articles, you ought to read everything about them and the, the sample sizes and all this other stuff and start to find that it's really hard to prove anything exercise science based on the fact that you're measuring humans. So I think that this starts to get you guys to understand that this is why we're so confused on what works. This is why we have so many different ideas and opinions on what we do. Who do you listen to? And that's a great question. The answer is, I don't know. All I know is I think that there are three pillars of things that you need to have in order to be someone that has value to listen to. One, you need to have lasted at least 20 years in what you do. Two, you need to have a very high level education and show that you are willing to sacrifice your time, money, and energy in order to learn what you want to learn. And three, you need to probably be at a high level at some point in your life. I'm not saying you need to be Michael Jordan or Usain Bolt, but you need to be good at whatever you're teaching, as good as you can possibly get. The reason is, how do you know how to train through plateaus if you've never been in plateaus? And what you find is that researchers, although maybe they have their best intent to show you studies that are gonna help you get better, they have no practical experience. So that creates an issue. Then you have the other side of the factor, which you got guys that are meatheads. They're super strong, but they don't know how they're strong, and maybe some of that's just genetic. So then they don't understand the researchers, then everybody fights in the middle. So I find that there are very few of us that have done this for so long at a high level and went and educated ourselves to be better and show you guys better stuff. So remember those three pillars of things when you're starting to look at research, you're starting to evolve your own training. And if you need help, go on winningstrength.com and we're more than happy to show you the manuals or help you with online coaching and design stuff that's based for you.